You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today, we're tackling a lesser known work by the great Clark Ashton Smith, a short and eerie tale by the name of Thirteen Phantasms. This one first appeared in the March 1936 edition of the Fantasy Magazine. We hope you enjoy it. Thirteen Phantasms by Clark Ashton Smith I have been faithful to thee, Sinara, in my fashion. John Alvington tried to raise himself on the pillow, as he murmured in his thoughts the long familiar refrain of Dowson's lyric. But his head and shoulders fell back in an overflooding helplessness, and there trickled through his brain like a thread of icy water the realization that perhaps the doctor had been right. Perhaps the end was indeed imminent. He thought briefly of embalming fluids, immortelles, coffin nails, and falling swords, but such ideas were quite alien to his trend of mind, and he preferred to think of Elspeth. He dismissed his mortuary musings with an appropriate shudder. He often thought of Elspeth these days, but of course he had never really forgotten her at any time. Many people called him a rake, but he knew and had always known that they were wrong. It was said that he had broken, or materially dented, the hearts of twelve women, including those of his two wives. And strangely enough, in view of the exaggerations commonly characteristic of gossip, the number was correct. Yet he, John Alvington, knew to a certainty that only one woman, who no one reckoned among the twelve, had ever really mattered in his life. He had loved Elspeth and no one else. He had lost her through a boyish quarrel which was never made up, and she had died a year later. The other women were all mistakes, mirages. They had attracted him only because he fancied, for varying periods, that he had found in them something of Elspeth. He had been cruel to them, perhaps, and most certainly he had not been faithful. But in forsaking them, had he not been all the truer to Elspeth? Somehow his mental image of her was more distinct today than in years. As if a gathering dust had been wiped away from a portrait, he saw with strange clearness the elfin teasing of her eyes, and the light tossing of brown curls that always accompanied her puckish laughter. She was tall, unexpectedly tall for so fairy-like a person, but all the more admirable thereby, and he had never liked any but tall women. How often he had been startled, as if by a ghost, in meeting some women with a similar mannerism, a similar figure, or expression of eyes, or cadence of voice, and how complete had been his disillusionment, when he came to see the unreality and fallaciousness of the resemblance. How irreparably she, the true love, had come sooner or later between him and all the others. He began to recall things that he had almost forgotten, such as the carnelian cameo brooch she had worn on the day of their first meeting, and a tiny mole on her left shoulder of which he had once had a glimpse when she was wearing a dress unusually low-necked for that period. He remembered, too, the plain gown of pale green that clung so deliciously to her slender form on that morning when he had flung away with a curt goodbye, never to see her again. Never, he thought to himself, had his memory been so good. Surely the doctor was mistaken for there was no failing of his faculties. It was quite impossible that he should be mortally ill, when he could summon all his recollections of Elspeth with such ease and 
clarity. Now, he went over all the days of their seven months' engagement, which might have ended in a felicitous marriage, if it had not been for her propensity to take unreasonable offence, and for his own answering flash of temper, and want of conciliatory tactics in the crucial quarrel. How near, how poignant it all seemed! He wondered what malign providence had ordered their parting, and had sent him on a vain quest from face to illusory face for the remainder of his life. He did not, could not remember the other women, only that he had somehow dreamed for a little while that they resembled Elspeth. Others might consider him a Don Juan, but he knew himself for a hopeless sentimentalist, if there ever had been one. What was that sound? he wondered. Had someone opened the door of the room? It, it must be the nurse, for no one else ever came at that hour in the evening. The nurse was a nice girl, though not at all like Elspeth. He tried to turn a little so that he could see her, and somehow succeeded, by a titanic effort altogether disproportionate to the feeble movement. It was not the nurse after all, for she was always dressed in immaculate white, befitting her profession. This woman wore a dress of cool, delectable green, pale as the green of shoaling seawater. He could not see her face, for she stood with back turned to the bed, but there was something oddly familiar in that dress, something that he could not quite remember at first. Then, with a distinct shock, he knew that it resembled the dress worn by Elspeth, on the day of their quarrel, the same dress he had been picturing to himself a little while before. No one ever wore a gown of that length and style nowadays. Who on earth could it be? There was a queer familiarity about her figure, too, for she was quite tall and slender. The woman turned, and John Alvington saw that it was Elspeth the very Elspeth from whom he had parted with a bitter farewell, and who had died without ever permitting him to see her again. Yet, how could it be but Elspeth, when she had been dead so long? Then, by a swift transition of logic, how could she have ever died, since she was here before him now? It seemed so infinitely preferable to believe that she still lived, and he wanted so much to speak to her, but his voice failed him when he tried to utter her name. Now he thought that he heard the door open again, and became aware that another woman stood in the shadows behind Elspeth. She came forward, and he observed that she wore a green dress identical in every detail with that worn by his beloved. She lifted her head, and the face was that of Elspeth, with the same teasing eyes and whimsical mouth. But how could there be two Elspeths? In profound bewilderment, he tried to accustom himself to the bizarre idea, and even as he wrestled with a problem so unaccountable, a third figure in pale green, followed by a fourth and a fifth, came in and stood beside the first two. Nor were these the last— for others entered one by one, till the room was filled with women, all of whom wore the raiment and the semblance of his dead sweetheart. None of them uttered a word, but all looked at Alvington with a gaze in which he now seemed to discern a deeper mockery than the elfin tantalizing he had once found in the eyes of Elspeth. He lay very still, fighting with a dark, terrible perplexity. How could there be such a multitude of Elspeths, when he could remember knowing only one? And how many were there anyway? Something prompted him to count them, and he found that there were thirteen of the spectres in green. And having ascertained this fact, he was struck by something familiar about the number. Didn't people say that he had broken the hearts of thirteen women? Or was the total only twelve? Anyway, if you counted Elspeth herself, 
who had really broken his heart, there would be thirteen. Now all the women began to toss their curly heads in a manner he recalled so well, and all of them laughed with a light and puckish laughter. Could they be laughing at him? Elspeth had often done that, but he had loved her devotedly nevertheless. All at once, he began to feel uncertain about the precise number of figures that filled his room. It seemed to him at one moment that there were more than he had counted, and then that there were fewer. He wondered which one among them was the true Elspeth, for after all he felt sure that there had never been a second, only a series of women apparently resembling her, who were not really like her at all when you came to know them. Finally, as he tried to count them and scrutinize the thronging faces, all of them grew dim and confused and indistinct, and he half forgot what he was trying to do. Which one was Elspeth? Or had there ever been a real Elspeth? He was not sure of anything at the last, when oblivion came, and he passed that realm in which there are neither women nor phantoms, nor love, nor numerical problems. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, Click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.